How's it going? Um, I guess you kind of already know sort of who I am. Uh, but I did want to start right off by saying I seem a little bit zonked. It is because I have a 12-week-old puppy at home. Um, so this is Tumult. And um, you know, if my energy seems depleted. <laughs> uh, but so I'm, I'm here. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I joined the university in the summer of 2020. Um, I'll just wait for you to remember that. Uh, it was not the most promising time to start anything. <laughs> but I've been very excited by and nourished by how my colleagues and students have withstood everything that has been thrown our way over the past few years. This term has been my favorite by far. Um, it's not just because I've been lucky to teach some excellent students in two classes that I've really loved. Oh, we are going to go with this one. OK. <laughs> But uh, it's because I've, this is the term that the school has felt the most like a community. Um, and to that end, I want to start by shining a light on uh, two of my fellow English professors, Jay Gamble and David Kutnikoff. David's there. Put your hand up. <laughs> Jay and David uh, in February initiated, uh, ugh, sorry, initiated an open mic uh, series for our creative writing students. Um, and through it, we've come to uh, I guess know for sure something that we've always suspected, which is that we have excellent writers at this school. Um, and I'm very thrilled that those students now have this venue to share the work that they are doing, and which more of them, I believe, will continue to uh, write and share as part of our new creative writing minor in the English department. You may well find the work that I'm about to share tonight to be pedantic or tiresome, but if you love fiction and poetry and you are excited by young writers finding their voices, I'd encourage you to come to the next open mic in the fall. Um, I should probably let you know a little bit. Well, I don't know. You kind of already know stuff about me now. <laughs> but uh, for some reason, I anticipated not being introduced. <laughs> but um, at the university, I teach a pretty wide gamut of courses in the English department, uh, from the full 400-year history of American literature to a variety of topics courses based around writing in the 20th and 21st centuries. This past term, I've been teaching a course on black art and thought. That's the syllabus on the left. And uh, a, sem a senior seminar entitled Depressions, in which we read literature from the 1930s alongside major theoretical works that engage with concepts of mental health and melancholia. This latter class draws directly from my academic research, in which I specialize in a field that is generally called modernism, a broad category. Was that a, an oh no? <laughs> I know we have a bad reputation. <laughs> um, Modernism is a broad category that refers to writing from the first decades of the 20th century, but it typically concentrates particularly on fiction and poetry by disparate writers and movements who were self-consciously experimental and, as a result, curious about and often critical of the rules that previous generations of writers had followed. You might have heard of modernist writers like James Joyce, there on the top left. I love this photo of T.S. Eliot and Virginia Woolf that was uh, taken uh, at an estate just outside of Oxford. Uh, and then up there on the top right is Langston Hughes. But here in Western Canada, we were the adopted home of modernists like Malcolm Lowry, there he is uh, with the top down, and Dorothy Livesay. One of the reasons I love specializing in modernist literature is because it has a close relationship to the emergence of literary study as an academic discipline. How you tell this story depends a little bit on which country you're telling it in, but after departments of rhetoric found themselves increasingly focused on novels and poetry in the last decades of the 1800s, the widespread emergence of distinct academic departments for formal literary study tended to follow the First World War in both the United States and England. And there are tons of kind of exceptions to this rule. I think probably in North America, Harvard's history and lit department still considers itself to be the first. They formed in 1905, but my druthers are to point to the formation in whole as opposed to the sort of the first emergence. Um, but so for instance, like Dalhousie University in Halifax will refer to themselves as having the first English department in Canada in 1865, but it, it was a department of rhetoric until 1920 something. Um, but okay, so the English department itself really starts to become a major feature of campus intellectual life only following the Second World War, when university enrollments swelled as a result of veteran support services like the GI Bill in the United States. Not only were these major modernists, the contemporary-ish writers of widespread acclaim when these institutional developments occurred, but their interest in the rules of literature and how to break them often meant that they wrote insightful and influential essays about other writers alongside their imaginative art. 
Many of them came to teach from these essays and from the research that they undertook as part of their uh, creative writing, becoming some of the first English professors. In fact, just last week, I visited a class at the University of Calgary to talk about T.S. Eliot. This was the risk of getting a beer. Um, where I encouraged students to read his strange, powerful, long poem, The Wasteland, through the lecture notes that he left behind for a class that he taught on what was then contemporary literature. Um, and so this is taken from the notes that he left behind, which his teaching assistant dutifully deposited in Harvard's archive. Um, and I, I love, first of all, that uh, someone who is on the precipice of winning the Nobel Prize in Literature begins his syllabus with a warning about his own ignorance, prejudices, and limitations. It's sort of very humble. But I also love this sort of prefatory statement because of what Eliot says is sort of required when you study contemporary literature. He writes, well, this is the, the third paragraph. Why study it at all? Obviously, it cannot be studied with the same methods as literature of the past period. No values are settled, nor is the general historical import of anything clear. Students must rely very much upon, we'd prefer it if he didn't use a masculine singular pronoun, but we'll move past that, uh, <laughs> very much upon their own sensibility and judgment and decide what is worthwhile for them. And I think that you know this sort of arcane, abstract, abstruse sort of master whose great poem includes untranslated 13th century Italian, making this gesture towards his students to say, no, please, trust your instincts, trust your taste, come to know what you like and follow it rather than you know, dutifully follow what I tell you. I, I just always think that this is such a, a useful and kind of disarming way into his work. Um, but this is a kind of circular way to say that much of what we, that is to say English professors, do now has precedence in what they were doing then. Of course, criticism, criticism. <laughs> Evaluative and interpretive writing about existing artful uses of language has existed for about as long as literature has, and certainly my favorite of Plato's dialogues. I'm, you know, I'm sure you have your own favorites. But the Phaedrus begins with the great philosopher Socrates and his student Phaedrus comparing and critiquing speeches that other orator philosophers had just delivered in a competition and sort of trying to decide if the right speech about love had won. So when I talk about modernism as an important origin point for literary study, what I'm really talking about is the professionalization of the kind of teaching that we do and of the kind of writing that we publish. Work that goes by a variety of names, but I generally prefer criticism. One of my teachers in graduate school, John Guillory, has recently published a book about this professionalization and what it has and has not done for its practitioners and its students. He begins it with a kind of translingual joke about the relationship between how we acquire expertise and how that expertise influences our worldview. He points to a French phrase that doesn't totally have a clean English translation, deformation professionnelle, to argue that all formation is necessarily a kind of deformation. In this case, the formation of a given academic discipline is the deformative controlling, arranging, and transmission of an ever-expanding and uncertain range of knowledge as well as the development and credentialization of the individuals like us who participate in controlling, arranging, and transmitting that information. Guillory writes, quote, we ought to hear the French expression underlying the English in order to recover the full spectrum of these meanings, from the neutral professional training, which like all learning changes the learner, to the harsher sense of deformation, invoking the ways in which professional training produces a certain bias of perspective a way of seeing the world from within an occupational enclosure. So the term discipline might not be as arbitrary as you would want to believe. If you picked up on that language about bias, it might not surprise you to learn that Guillory has become infamous for his skepticism about the political efficacy of criticism. Although I should say, his claim tends to have less to do with avoiding or limiting the political in our published work and in our classrooms and more to do with what I think is a very common sense view about whether or not reading the right 30-page essay about a Virginia Woolf novel is going to convince you that the state should be run in a certain way. But when we begin to think about the deformations that occurred within the formation of professionalized literary study, we might start with the very title of the discipline. English is, of course, the name of a language as well as an academic department. And although our focal texts may be considerably more diverse now than they were 100 years ago, I think that everyone in teaching in an English department would eventually admit that there are things written in English that aren't really proper for us to study. And from another angle, Guillory was being willfully perverse by beginning his book about the bureaucratic history of the English department with a phrase whose foreign language would seem to necessarily exclude it from our realm. In short, these are two of our borders. <laughs>
but there's at least a third. English also denotes a particular national literature, that of a nation that was, in the early 20th century, enormously influential through its global empire, but one that today represents only about 10% of native, speaker, native English speakers on Earth, and really only about 3% of all people who speak and write in English worldwide. This has had lasting consequences for our, how our field is arranged and transmitted. At Queen's in Ontario, where I did my undergrad, seven of the required 10 courses to receive an English major were all explicitly organized around the history of England. But there was something counterintuitive about the sense of the nation's necessary role in defining a field of literary study, particularly when we think about the modernist writers who influenced the field's formation. I'm just gonna back up for a second. Joyce, Eliot, and Hughes all spent the majority of their adult lives away from the places where they were born, and all of them were also avid translators. That they even came to be representative writers for this moment in history is somewhat strange. The English critic Raymond Williams once pointed out the peculiar way that literary modernism normalized expatriate life at the precise moment when frontiers were starting to become much more strictly policed and when, with the First World War, the passport was instituted. And actually, at a, a conference in October, I'm going to talk a little bit about where and how the passport becomes a kind of, I think we have an intuitive sense of it as representing cosmopolitan or global life, but I think it's, it's actually the moment that you have to use your passport that your relationship to the category of the nation really kind of becomes vivid. Scholars of modernism have spent the last 20 or so years working to undo this sense of the nation as the necessary best category for arranging the entire history of literary expression. And you're much more likely now to see a category like global modernism than even transatlanticism, which referred to the North American writers of the lost generation who went to live in London and Paris. The goal here, has not only been to offer a more diverse and thus broadly representative account of ambition, experimentation, and influence, but to heighten attention on where and how crossing borders of any kind can often bring those borders into sharper relief. I think this is gonna be better. Uh, in my own work, I'm particularly interested in when and how these crossings highlight the rules associated with lyric poetry and how strange it is that many poets turned to the lyric, typically thought of as private, personal, and inwardly emotional, to discuss the shifts in social life that they observed during the Great Depression. The talk that I gave when I interviewed for this job, in fact, back in November 2019, concerned the sonnets that the Jamaican poet Claude McKay wrote during the half decade that he spent living in North Africa, and why it was that he turned to a po poetic form commonly associated with Shakespeare and courtly romance to comment on the somewhat baffling freedom from color consciousness that he felt in the segregated cities of Marrakesh and Tangier. Now, I am suspicious of the way that this turn towards global modernism has occurred simultaneously with a decline in the English major and the collapse of hiring English professors. There are roughly 20% as many tenure track jobs posted in a given year now as there were just 20 years ago. And this is despite ongoing increases in college enrollment, vast increases in tuition, increases in the number of PhDs conferred, uh, and the fact that the decline in the English major is nowhere near the 80% drop off that this hiring collapse would suggest. But it makes a certain amount of sense that those of us who are left here would be asked to be responsible for more and more writing. And this development has, for whatever its background, brought our teaching and research in the field into closer relation with the reading and writing of the authors who form its historical core. I think we need to go even further though. One of the formations, which is to say deformational, assumptions of professionalized literary study is that it is something that we get better at over time and that big ideas and challenging texts demand years of intensive study and a lifetime of butter reading to be adequately understood. But Virginia Woolf herself argued that the foundation of good, provocative literary art is always, in a sense, juvenile. In an essay-length reply to one of her critics who had accused her of not, writing, or not having written any mem memorable characters, Woolf suggested that her novels were much more deeply concerned with her character's ability to read character than her own skill at constructing them, and that she had emphasized this ability in her readers because of how essential this character reading ability is for our daily life, even if it often becomes invisible over time. Wolf writes, I have said that people have to acquire a good deal of skill in character reading if they are to live a single year of life without disaster. I, I think that that's true. But it is the art of the young, 
In middle age and in old age, the art is practiced mostly for its uses, and friendship and other adventures and experiments in the art of reading character are seldom made. But novelists differ from the rest of the world because they do not cease to be interested in character when they have learned enough about it for practical purposes. So, Wolf is not arguing that becoming a better reader is an important part of growing up, but rather that it helps to keep us young that it helps us to retain some of the unprepossessing way that the young engage with the world, to maintain the capacity for being surprised that begins with approaching others without a predetermined sense of what they will say or do. Literary art that confirms the prejudices that we have formed on the way to adulthood is almost always boring and offers a mediocre text for scholarship and teaching. John Gillery himself is fond of quoting the great modernist critic William Empson, who wrote in 1935 that, even the bourgeois themselves do not like literature to have too much bourgeois ideology. More than length or aesthetic innovation or historical influence, I think it is this capacity for wonder and surprise about the known world that seems to make a book worth discussing for decades. And here, I want to tip my cap specifically to my colleague Elizabeth Galloway, who brings this approach to her research and teaching on children's literature about which she spoke about through this series in 2020. Now is also probably the right time to extend a thank you to Catherine Reeder in the Dean's Office who organizes the Public Prof series and who is one of those vital people who make a campus feel like a community. There she is in the back. She doesn't know this, but she's also part of the reason why I decided on this title and this topic for my talk tonight. Um, the title, What Do We Do? I, I kind of mean it in two senses, right? On the one hand, what do we do is like, well, when you scurry back to your office, English professor, what happens in there? <laughs> but, but it's also you know, meant to, to think about where and how our sustained engagements with art over time produces or provokes certain kinds of ethical imperatives. And I think that, you know, Catherine, I hope you won't mind that this emerged from a sort of odd thing that happened uh, in my first year. So back when I first started, Catherine interviewed me for a series that she had initiated to help everyone on campus to get to know each other a bit better. And I was really grateful to have the chance to, uh, I guess let's say explain myself, um, to people who wouldn't meet me in person for at least another year. Um, it was a chance to get to know me and my old haircut, and I feel very embarrassed about some of the answers that I gave in here. <laughs> um, but something that I did get to talk about in this interview, which I really believe in, is in the mutually beneficial relationship between teaching, writing for popular venues like magazines and newspapers, and formal academic scholarship. But also, as a result of this interview, a colleague in the sciences reached out to me with an offer to collaborate. And I was initially quite excited, as my brother-in-law teaches in astrophysics, and we once co-wrote an article about black holes and the sort of misconceptions about them that form in the popular culture. But as it turned out, this offer to collaborate was actually an offer to proofread and correct his students' work for him because he was tired of grammatical errors. <laughs> it's probably worth mentioning here that every discipline has its own genre conventions and all of those conventions change over time. 30 years ago, I think even the most self-satisfied literary scholar probably would not have talked about himself as much as I've talked about myself already or about their dog. And I'm nowhere near as well equipped to teach the writing conventions of the sciences as someone who actually teaches and publishes in them. But I was, and kind of remain, struck by the premise of his offer. He had assumed that there was no research to be done in the arts, and that during the months when I'm not teaching, I'm probably starved for something to do. I don't know if you know this meme. Now, every academic, regardless of specialization, has to become relatively fluent at communicating what it is they do to people who don't do that thing. And often, at least when we talk about it, this takes the form of, so what do your parents think that you do and what do you tell them? <laughs> but this was the first time that I'd encountered this kind of skepticism from a fellow member of the secular cloth. And after a couple of days and I got over myself, I started to think about the problem that we do have in the arts of conveying what it is that we do and the value of it. The boundaries of knowledge and history and writing that seem so clear to me and to others who are similarly professionalized are not nearly so visible if you don't spend your days explaining where they are and when you can cross them. And I started to wonder too about whether or not part of the problem has to do with the way that our research really is informed by our teaching, even in our introductory classes, in a way that it may not be in other disciplines. 
I am sure that there have been historical instances in which someone has learned something new about carbon while teaching chemistry 101, but I doubt that it happens as frequently as when I, at least, teach a novel or a poem to a group of students who have just finished high school and who are encountering it without the blinkers and biases that my professionalization has given me. And there's a part of me that sort of suspects that this, this dynamic, this capacity, this thing that happens in the classroom is one of the reasons why everyone assumes that if you were studying English uh, in college that you're going to go on to become a teacher. It's, it's certainly because I have become a much better teacher through every instance I've had teaching a text. And so for the remainder of my time with you, I, I want to walk you through one of these moments from my own career. Uh, so what follows is a version of a talk that I gave in Chicago a couple weeks ago, and which will appear at greater length in an academic journal next year. But the idea for it starts with a class that I was teaching back in February of 2020. Don't worry, there will be no COVID stuff. Um, and with a moment when, I like to say, SpongeBob SquarePants rescued me. If only in the way that teachers and their lessons often need rescuing. So. It was the second of three sessions on Charles Chestnut's novel, The Marrow of Tradition, and I was trying to explain Sien Nye's theory of zaniness and how it might help us to think through the novel's pivotal cakewalk scene. I should explain what any of that means. So I'm going to start with the novel, then the theory, and then how I failed to bring it together. So. The Mirror of Tradition is a fascinating novel about the failure of the Reconstruction era in the American South, the period that immediately followed on the American Civil War. It was written by a man who had turned to literary fiction to make arguments about interracial uh, life and uh, everyday life in the former slaveholding South that he was not able to make through his professional life as a lawyer. Charles Chestnut is best known today for his short stories written in a version of black dialect. It was a calling card that he came to regret and eventually wrote to one of his editor friends that it was, quote, almost a despairing task to write in it. The fact is, of course, that there is no such thing as a black dialect. But write in it he did, because that was what the white readers of prestigious magazines at the turn of the last century wanted to read, largely influenced by the Joel Chandler Harris stories that would eventually become famous as the Song of the South. This is, you might remember, Br'er Rabbit and Old Possum, or the the story of the tar baby. In Chestnut's version of these kinds of stories, though, the black narrators tend to be more canny, and they align themselves with the carpetbagger northerners who have come down to purchase former plantations to get a modicum of justice in the aftermath of the Civil War. The first of these stories, The Gooford Grapevine, was the first short story by a black person to be published in the Atlantic Monthly, even though it seems likely now that Chestnut's editors did not realize that he was black. In The Marrow of Tradition, however, Chestnut turns his focus onto these white editors and their complicity in the rise in lynching that was taking place across the former slaveholding territories of the United States. The novel is based on a real race riot that took place in Wilmington, North Carolina, in which a large white mob gathered to overthrow the black and white elected city council and to expel all of the town's black residents, killing at least 60 of them and perhaps as many as 300 in the process. Uh, this happened in 1898. In Chestnut's novel, this uprising is ignited by an apparent murder of a white widow by a black servant, which occurs in the hours following a cakewalk performance, which is staged for a group of northern visitors to the town. The, uh, quote, vague suggestion of unreality that white newspaper editor Lee Ellis detects in the cakewalk performance can be explained as his having intuited that the winner, supposedly the black servant Sandy Campbell, is in fact Sandy's white employer, Tom Delamar, who has donned black mace blackface and Sandy's stolen clothes. But the entire nature of the ritualized performance, organized to elicit spasms of delight from these northern visitors, suggests a kind of unreality anyway, as do the racialized layers of upstairs-downstairs competition. Cakewalks were a real historical practice, and in the novel's version, a cakewalk involves black domestic laborers donning the black tie outfits of their uh, employers and competing against each other in a performance of exaggerated formality one which only takes place at the behest of those same white employers, and with an implied sense of competitive ownership between those employers for whose wait staff will perform the best. This vortex produces the coincident superfluity of leisure and the grotesque consortions that Chestnut describes observing. Sien Nye 
is a literary scholar and cultural critic who teaches at the University of Chicago and who is known as one of the foremost affect theorists. Affect theory is a field of inquiry that is now probably about 20 years old and which emerged from gender studies and queer theory, but in which the focus of inquiry is less on how a given self-conscious identity comes to understand and express itself and more on the ways that developments in our culture have encouraged or intensified particular kinds of emotional response or feeling. Her 2012 study, Our Aesthetic Categories, argues that mechanized and financialized modernity has provoked the predominance of artistic sensibilities that may not themselves necessarily be new, but which have come to be newly significant through features that dominate our lives today in a way that they did not 100 years ago. And specifically, she argues that the qualities of cuteness, zaniness, and interesting, but in the sense of being merely interesting, have become more significant as productivity in the workplace has increased, but wages have declined. I was thinking of zaniness in relation to Chestnut's cakewalk scene because Nye locates its etymological origin in another exaggerated performance of domestic labor. Um, I'm gonna compare an image of a cakewalk to uh, Nye's sort of precedent, but the cakewalk image is like, it's historically sourced, but it's also kind of arrestingly racist, so just like, fair warning. Um, Nye goes all the way back to the Zani figure of the improvisational Commedia dell'arte from 16th century Italy, in which this figure, the Zani, was typically an itinerant servant who was defined by specifically non-specific work, personal services provided ad hoc to the household. The Zani's slapstick performance and sincere desire to please eventually become the zaniness that we receive today an affect that critiques through exaggeration the extreme productivity and frantic obedience desired by many modern employers. According to Nye, quote, zaniness is as much about desperate laboring as playful fun. Nye went on to provide, or in her book, she provides a host of examples from the kind of abstract or arcane like Dada as Hugo Ball through to work that might be more approachable in the contemporary like Jim Carrey's performance in The Cable Guy or Lucille Ball's Lucy Ricardo in I Love Lucy. And we might notice here in the sort of collection of, of examples that they are all non-literary. And so part of the implied argument, I think, in Nye's work, and part of what I think makes it so compelling, is that she's suggesting that a fulsome understanding of the present moment cannot be fully achieved through literary art alone. But the problem for me <laughs> with Nye's various examples is that they were all unfamiliar to my students. And here's the moment where the lesson was in jeopardy. But mercifully, a student said that what I was describing sounded an awful lot like an episode of SpongeBob. Just give me a sec to cue this up. Okay. Employee of the Month, Season 1, Episode 12B, first aired on February 12, 2000. And I'm here to tell you that it is a surprisingly radical text. It opens with SpongeBob at work at a fast food restaurant where he is telling his coworker Squidward the judging for the employee of the month has just begun. Okay, I'll buy. What is it, SpongeBob? Do you know what today is? A noise Squidward day. Ah, no, silly. That's on the 15th. Today's the beginning of the judging for employee of the month. SpongeBob, don't you know that award is a scam? What do you mean? Mr. Krabs gives you that award so you'll work harder for no extra money. That is not true, Squidward. He gives it to me because I work harder. You could win it too if you tried harder. Oh, for what? To get my face on the wall of shame? Squidward, you've got it all wrong. The camera peels back to reveal dozens and dozens of framed images of a smiling SpongeBob. So if this is a scam, it's clearly effective, right? <laughs> but nevertheless, SpongeBob worries that Squidward will still compete for the honorific, and so he starts to try to prevent Squidward from doing so. And ironically, SpongeBob's efforts are so annoying that Squidward becomes embroiled and feels like he needs to compete simply to try to prevent SpongeBob from receiving the honor. And the next <clears throat> eight minutes of the 10-minute episode are just them kind of thwarting each other. After a sleepless night of spoofs and goofs, the two cartoon sea creatures race towards the restaurant and zanily perform their duties, punctuating each new action 
with an appeal to their employer. That smile. You can't trust him as far as you can throw him. As soon as he stops shaking my hand, I'm gonna make a run for it. Money, money, gonna make some money. Ah, it warms me well to see me employees coming in so early. Boys, you're early. So glad that I'm sharing this stupid work with you. <laughs> so, in the end, their excessive productivity destroys the business both physically, they make so many burgers that the restaurant explodes, and economically, as the burgers scattering means that Mr. Krabs can no longer control their sale. And so, um, I'm not too proud to let you know that when this moment occurred and I really felt like the lesson was getting away from me, we did just watch this episode of the show and and it rescued it, and I, I, felt, I felt an awful lot better about it. Um, but even though this helped my lesson to land, I was struck at the time, and have remained for the years since, stuck on the discrepancy between the SpongeBob that I encountered in this episode, and this was the first time I'd ever seen an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants, with the SpongeBob with whom I was somehow intimately familiar, the SpongeBob of memes. Where Nye turned back to 16th century Italian drama to understand I Love Lucy, I came to turn back to 16th century Italian art history to understand the discrepancy between the SpongeBob of memes and the SpongeBob of the show. There we go, yeah. So as Gothold of Frame Lessing tells it, the 1506 recovery of the Lao Kuan statue group in the ruins of the Baths of Trajan in Rome provoked a crisis of aesthetic philosophy the branch of philosophy that investigates the impact that art has upon us. Most of the people in the 16th century who were familiar with Lao Kuan knew him from his appearance in Virgil's Aeneid, the epic poem about the founding of Rome. In it, Lao Kuan appears as a Trojan priest of Neptune, who intuits the lie of the hollow horse given to the city by the Greeks. And even though he is a priest of Neptune, Neptune hates Troy so much that he conjures two huge coiled snakes to kill the Trojan priest and his son. The fact that the priest has been killed by his own god convinces the Trojans to admit the horse into their city. But Virgil doesn't simply tell us about Lao Kuan's demise. He describes it in kind of horrifying detail. Um, and this is just a kind of quick aside, but this translation of Virgil um, is relatively recent. It came out three years ago and is part of a, a really cool kind of widespread publishing effort to um, bring translations of classical poetry into the contemporary and specifically to highlight the work of women translators. And so I, I just can't say enough good things about Sarah Rudin's translation of the Aeneid. If, you, if you've ever, if you ever want to read the Aeneid for the first time, this is, now's the time to do it. Um, <laughs> and so Rudin, as Rudin has it, 
He fought to rip apart the knotted forms. Their slime and poison black drool soaked his fillets. He shrieked of agony. His shrieks of agony rose to the sky as when a bull escapes the altar, shedding the ax that was half buried in his neck. So the Lao Kuan statue group dates from about the same time as the Virgil poem. And yet the sculptors from Rhodes, as it turned out, rendered Lao Kuan's moment, or moment, rendered Lao Kuan's mouth half opened with downwards, downturned sides. This posture suggests more of a kind of moan of discomfort or a sort of like an ugh of discomfort <laughs> more than shrieks of agony. And so for about 250 years, the question was why? Writing in 1767, Lessing tested a couple of local theories. Perhaps a screaming mouth is not beautiful as a statue is obliged to be. Perhaps his scream would imply a moment of climax, where sculptures must seem energetic rather than on the verge of collapse. But eventually Lessing arrives at a sort of unified theory of the arts. He writes, the essential difference between poetry and the visual arts is found in that the former is a visible progressive act, the various parts of which take place little by little in the sequence of time, whereas the latter is a visible static act, the various parts of which develop next to one another in space. But if painting, by virtue of its sign or its means of imitation, which it can combine in space alone, must completely renounce time, then progressive acts, because progressive, do not belong amongst its subjects. Painting must contain itself or content itself with acts next to one another or with mere bodies. So as Lessing continues, we learn that these fundamental orientations towards extent, whether through time or through space, not only shape the audience experience of a given artwork, but imply a set of rules regarding the conditions for success. Progressive acts belong to those media that are experienced through time, whereas complex juxtapositional structures belong to the spatial. Poetry is best equipped to, rem to examine ugliness because the words describing that ugliness can be themselves beautiful. Theater and dance, and by extension film and television, are hybrid forms in which spatial signification can complicate or can provide relief from the sort of aesthetics through time, the durational aesthetics that uh, Lessing describes poetry as possessing. Lessing's systematic study as well as his honesty, his self-consciousness, and his wry wit have led to the enduring power of his Lao Kuan, an essay upon the limits of painting and poetry. And it remains the origin point for the subcategory of aesthetic philosophy that is interested in artworks that borrow from other mediums, a field now called intermedial aesthetics. It's a field of particular interest to me because modernist poets very rarely hung out with only other poets, and they tended to be equally fascinated by contemporaneous developments in visual art, in music, in cinema, and in dance. But I've also, lately, been thinking about the field, this as a field of philosophy that might bring some insight into the predominance of memes in the smartphone era. So bringing Lessing into the present, some risks, but I'll, I'll try to push through, uh, an intermedial aesthetic account of memes and their appreciation would seem to belong to the spatial or plastic arts. We consume them visually, and whatever text is present is obliged, I think, to be brief enough and large enough that it can be taken in without feeling that duration sensation that reading sometimes gives us. Including too much text is a classic meme failure. But memes are also, not just potentially, but are necessarily iterative. Their virality depends upon their ability to adapt and upon the sort of decidedly minor sense of surprise created by the recontextualization of a familiar image. That is to say, what makes a meme a meme more than a funny picture with some words is the trace of prior forms, a sense that any individual meme received as such exists within a durational structure of serial encounters. Yet employee of the month, gives a clear sense that there are different rules for this version of hybrid spatial temporal aesthetics than those that exist for film and television, even for the sitcom form, which seems to similarly rely upon minor surprises of recontextualization. And the clue for me is in SpongeBob's zaniness. While desperate laboring, per nigh, certainly occurs in the episode Employee of the Month, it is wholly absent from the many screenshots from the show that have achieved durable meme status. As a succinct point of contrast, I'm offering you the meme on the right-hand side. 
uh, the SpongeBob meme that I, at least in early 2020, encountered most frequently. As it has come to be known, mocking SpongeBob began to first circulate in May of 2017 and depicts SpongeBob at work at the Krusty Krab and in his uniform and hat, but cross-eyed and pitched over at the waist. It tends to be used to lampoon insufficiently self-aware behaviors, often circulating with captions rendered in sticky caps. The suggestion is that whatever idea the caption expresses is beneath intellectual engagement. It's better dismissed through malicious imitation. In the source episode, however, SpongeBob strikes this odd posture only when it is discovered that he ineluctably responds to seeing plaid patterns by clucking like a chicken. And so even though he is carrying plates and cleaning the restaurant, he is maliciously shown a plaid kilt. And he immediately drops his cleaning and pitches over to Cluck. So it's another instance of workplace degradation that exists in some kind of pathological proximity to saniness, but it could not be further from the sentiment that this image is usually used to express. The SpongeBob of this meme is canny and condescending, mirthful but cruel. He seems to utterly lack the capacity for exploitation by which the television character is frequently defined. The fact that so many images, phrases, and moments from the show have become memes suggests that the source material is particularly fertile and thus, I think, particularly useful for interrogating these intermedial aesthetic rules for memes. In fact, the entire memification of SpongeBob began mere months after the show premiered. The earliest entry on the I take it to be authoritative, website knowyourmeme.com, <laughs> appear during the first years of this century. And I think the anthropological leanings of the website, I actually feel very strongly about this, suggest that anything recorded there must have had a prior circulation. I don't think that they're crafting memes themselves. I, I take their mission too seriously. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But at least one SpongeBob meme appeared as part of the sort of pre-social media meme page phenomena that many of you would, might remember as you're the man now dog. This was a sort of subcategory of websites that just had like one funny image on them. Um, and it's worth mentioning that new SpongeBob memes are still entering circulation today. And here, I wanna draw your attention to the fact that in the years immediately following the recovery of the Lao Kwan statue group from the Baths of Trajan, something like Lao Kwan memes started to circulate in early 16th century Italy. These are th just three ceramic Urbino renderings of Lao Kwan and his sons, each of which, uh, it's very difficult for me to um, sort of explain them simply as sort of sketches or kitsch, because each of them take a pretty strong position on Lao Kuan's agony, on his sartorial choices or lack thereof, and his site specificity at Troy. Um, so none of these seem to be just direct sketches drawn from the statue group. There, there's something else happening here. Um, the sort of the brutalism of the center one, you know, I, I don't know if you can look past the penis, but I, I find something extremely affecting about the sort of the starkness of the surroundings, how depopulated it is. Um, <laughs> And, and Lao Kuan memes seem to have recurred kind of throughout the history of visual art uh, with the English engraver and poet William Blake famously creating this one in the early 1820s, um, sorry, 1720s. Um, this strikes me as a classic failed meme where there was just way too much text for it to be appreciated as a meme itself. <laughs> um, but the fact of the matter is that not only did this statue group and its recovery and its relationship to the Virgil poem provoke considerations of, of where and how art can affect us and what the different rules are, but that it, it immediately had this kind of alternate circulation. And I think the very fact of being ceramic, if you'll forgive the kind of obviousness, um, these seem like dishes that were meant to move around the table, right? This seems like something you were meant to uh, circulate in a, a domestic, but in a, I think in a loving way. So, um, Gotthold of Frame Lessing didn't account for ceramics in his treatise, nor did uh, his two most visible 20th century inheritors. Um, on the left hand side, uh, this is Clement Greenberg's essay, Towards a Newer Lao Kuan from 1940. And on the right hand side, uh, this is the sort of title page of Irving Babbitt's New Lao Kuan, an essay on the confusion of the arts. Um, the left hand side, or the right hand side is from 1910. 
left-hand side is from 1940, and now you're starting to see how my background in modernist studies has kind of led me into this conversation, because these are strange landmark precision-taking works of aesthetic theory that occurred coincident with the poetry that I, I typically study. Um, what Babbitt and Grem, bleh, sorry, so they don't talk about ceramics, but Babbitt and Greenberg do clarify that a crisis of intermedial aesthetics is almost always also a symptom of emergent anxieties about identity. But unlike the cakewalk scene, I don't think that race is the proper identity category for the SpongeBob intermedial crisis, if you'll allow me to call it that. Partly it's because I'm deferring to my friend, uh, the Canadian essayist Sarah Haggy, who included SpongeBob in her compelling survey, quote, all your favorite cartoon characters are black. But I'm also thinking with, and hopefully past, Chicago art critic W.J.T. Mitchell and his preface to a recent edited collection, Rethinking Lessing's Laocoon. Mitchell's rethinking is strange and anachronistic, and for a collection that insists upon its moment in the present, it doesn't include any consideration of the internet and its influence on aesthetic experience, much less a consideration of memes uh, in specific. And Mitchell opens the collection by noting that Lessing's sense of medial propriety may well have had its roots in his own father's rigid sense of gender and fashion. Evidently, Lessing Sr. wrote a thesis in 1714 entitled, De non communtando sexus habitu. <laughs> that is, on the impropriety of women wearing men's clothes and men women's. From this observation, Mitchell regrettably and transphobically continues. In the year 2016, which looks to be remembered as a time when European national borders were overwhelmed by a flood of immigrants, and when American popular culture was flooded with images and narratives of transgender individuals whose identity confusion went beyond clothing to include genital alteration, Lessing still matters a great deal. Obviously, this cross-application of Irving Babbitt's key term confusion is transphobic and bafflingly jingoistic too, insofar as the nod to the Mediterranean migrant crisis seems to impose an ethno-national identity category into an intermedial aesthetic philosophy in a way that is wholly absent from any prior interlocutors. But I think it's worth dwelling on this contested frontier. We can reject Mitchell's transphobia while acknowledging that his statement seems symptomatic of a broader contemporary anxiety about gender and its signification, one that has become increasingly militant in its policing of biological sex, its limits, and its rules. Nearly 50 years before the term culture war became a popular idiom, Clement Greenberg framed his historical survey of intermedial influence as a series of military confrontations of poetry invading painting by seeking loco-descriptive forms, and of painting invading poetry through allegorical compositions that required text-based explanations. For Greenberg, this is because the various arts always exist within a hierarchical power relation. Quote, there can be, I believe, such a thing as a dominant art form. Now, when it happens that a single art is given the dominant role, it becomes the prototype of all other art. The others try to shed their proper characters and imitate its effects. The dominant art, in turn, tries itself to absorb the functions of the others. A confusion of the arts results, by which the subservient ones are perverted and distorted. They are forced to deny their own nature in an effort to attain the effects of the dominant art. So, latent in Greenberg's account of intermedial dominance is a disentangling of sale value and, or art economy from the power of influence. Or in other words, a separation of the amount of money that one might conceivably sell an artwork for from the power that that artwork or genre might hold over the entire sphere of aesthetics. This is helpful, I think, for thinking about how memes may indeed be trash art, as my friend and art critic Brian Jacor has recently written, referring to the way that memes are cheap, disposable, and littering the internet but allow for them to also be dominant, not only, only as one of the most present sources of aesthetic experience in our daily lives, but also as having exerted a perverting and distorting influence on other art forms. I think this is a way to account for the meme adjacency that seems to define contemporary literary success, with book covers tending to receive broader reference and recognition than anything from the inside of those books. As far as I can tell, this tendency began quite seriously with the David Hammond's sculpture cover art, um, a piece entitled In the Hood, which depicts just the hood of a hoodie sort of mounted as though it is a sort of taxidermied hunting trophy. Uh, and it appeared on the cover of Claudia Rankin's poetry collection Citizen, which was published in 2014 um, and emerged uh, immediately from the Black Lives Matter movement. 
Um, the cover image appeared to circulate much more widely and recognizably than any of the text from within Rankin's book. But this tendency has since, I think, seemed to operate more sarcastically, as cover images of contemporary novels like My Year of Rest and Relaxation and Beautiful World, Where Are You?, becoming signifiers of femme cell subculture. But this aura of dominant trashiness also registers, I think, the counterintuitive way that the SpongeBob who invades other art forms is the SpongeBob as meme. Bernadette Mayer was a contemporary American poet of enormous vision and influence who passed away at the end of last year, and whose lasting impact may well involve her having taught works of language philosophy by Ludwig Wittgenstein and J.L. Austin to workshops of young punks at St. Mark's in the Bowery in New York City in the 60s. But it might also be for her hilarious and affecting book-length books about, or sorry, book-length poems about motherhood. And of course, she also wrote about SpongeBob. And in her 2008 poem, Inky Dinky Parlez Vous, Variations on SpongeBob SquarePants, the first part of its title borrowing from the First World War marching song, Mir describes a kind of rebellious theft from an international fast food franchise, only to transform the stolen property into trash. This is one of my classes I would make one of you read. Um, <laughs> Here, people steal SpongeBob SquarePants from the tops of Burger Kings and throw them in the Hudson River. I guess they think love is moral, even legal. Is this the sign of an incipient depression? See the water lily moon. Here, people steal SpongeBob SquarePants from the tops of Burger Kings and throw them in the Hudson River to prove, perhaps, that love is moral. It's legal for Burger King to exist and to put a SpongeBob on it, but it's not legal to steal it. Is this the sign of depression or of incipient water lily moon? So, Mayer's repetitive two stanza structure suggests, I think, a kind of poetic memeiness, with shifts in lineation and punctuation between the two stanzas implying an iterative relationship as opposed to a cognitive or a narratological one. The poem's uneven halves seem to exist and then be complicated rather than speak directly to each other. The insistent lower casing of the poem creates some uncertainty as to whether the sign of an incipient depression is emotional or is a result of the subprime mortgage crisis. But more consequentially, the S on the end of the surname square pants obscures whether the pronoun them refers to plural sponge bobs or to a variance from the binary, just as the question of love's discontinuous morality and legality firmly situates the poem within the mid-aughts conversations about marriage equality. The total impression suggests an inquiry into adolescence as well. It's not just that young adulthood feels like the moment in our lives most constrained by and futures defined by gender normativity and our individual relationships there too, but high school also seems to involve a lot of listless walking around and hanging out in parks and near rivers and throwing trash into things. Insofar as we can make an art out of living a life, our middle teen years feel like a period in which that life art is decidedly submissive, not dominant. Clement Greenberg did not cite Irving Babbitt explicitly, but the idea of confusion from his subtitle, as well as the modifier newer, suggests that he was always writing with Babbitt's work in mind. And for Babbitt, it was the gendering of the arts, much more than the rules proper to spatial and temporal practices that were becoming confused. Dating the beginning of this confusion to early 19th century misinterpretations of French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Babbitt believed that the function of criticism at the present hour should be to bring once more into honor the broad, masculine, vigorous distinction. But Babbitt locates primary responsibility for this confusion, not in the misinterpreting artists, but in an increasingly feminine audience. Quote, the enormous vogue of fiction in these latter days, as well as the reason why art and literature are appealing more and more exclusively to women and to men in their unmasculine moods. And curiously enough, Babbitt frames his inquiry in martial terms. Napoleon, according to Babbitt, once said to the German novelist Goethe, Je m'étonne qu'un aussi grand esprit que vous n'aimez pas les genres tranchés. We might translate this as, I'm not surprised that such a great soul as yours doesn't like to find genres but it's hard to ignore the fact that genre in French means genders as well. For Babbitt, it's clear that he is accusing Goethe of a deleterious confusion, one which his own confidence in his art has produced. Not rejecting so much as playing with anxieties like Napoleon's and Babbitt's and Mitchell's, trans performance artist Puppies Puppies has made headlines recently for a series of meme-adjacent works. <laughs> 
One of the most notable incorporates the distinction between SpongeBob as character and SpongeBob as meme. In Love, Bob Esponja, their performance for the Queer Thoughts booth of the Mexico City Material Arts Fair in 2015, puppies puppies dressed as SpongeBob and held aloft a placard with one of the most notorious and widely traveled SpongeBob memes. A fan created image of SpongeBob and Squidward locked in a passionate embrace. It's very difficult to determine the source of this image, largely due to the dozens of people online who appear to have taken credit for it over the years. But the intermedial quality of this performance seems clear to me, with the friendly imposture of the costume, recalling as it does the exuberant imitations that we find at theme parks and parades and decidedly family-friendly outings, standing with an inexplicit contrast with the erotic, effective, and identitarian suggestions of the image. And yet the point seems less to identify the contrast than to rejoice in dissonance. It is as though the Lao Kuan statue group was revealed to contain a tape deck which could play a recording of the Virgilian scream. And it's a reminder that fun, joy, and play exist in much closer proximity to beauty than we aesthetic theorists often admit. Lessing, however, reminds us, quote, conventionality was held of small account among the ancients. They felt that art and the attainment of beauty, its true end, could dispense with conventionalities altogether. Necessity invented clothes, but what has art to do with necessity? I wonder why this sentiment of Lessing's has never been taken as a riposte to his own father's treatise on the need for gender rigidity when it comes to clothes. But I want to leave you with these words of Lessing's, not just because I think that they anticipate the modernist flouting of rules that should, I believe, have more of an influence on how we practice and preach the appreciation and study of literature than the alternative rules that they eventually developed. But because I also think that it's a succinct way for thinking about how it is that we can all live lives that are, in many ways, unimaginable to the historical writers and artists and thinkers who we study. And yet, one of the best reasons for studying them, it seems to me, is that when we go looking for it, we sometimes find ourselves anticipated. This is not what the poet Ezra Pound had in mind when he told us to make it new but it's what we're doing in the English department. Thank you.